welcome to the latest edition of the Mind Gut Conversation, the interview series about topics related to health of the brain, the gut, and the environment. Today, I have the pleasure to talk to Dr. Joel Furman, a board certified family physician, six time New York Times bestselling author, and internationally recognized expert on nutrition and natural healing, who specializes in preventing and reversing disease through nutritional methods. Dr. Furman is the president of the Nutritional Research Foundation and on the faculty of Northern Arizona University Health Sciences Division. He has coined the term nutritarian to describe a nutrient-dense eating style designed to prevent cancer, slow aging, and extend lifespan. For over 25 years, Dr. Furman has shown that it's possible to achieve sustainable weight loss and reverse heart disease, diabetes, and many other illnesses using smart nutrition. In case you have not already seen it or read it, his latest national best-selling book is called Eat to Live, the Amazing Nutrient-Rich Program for Fast and Sustained Weight Loss. Shown here. So highly recommendable combination of science, studies, and very practical, detailed recommendations. Welcome to the show, Dr. Furman. Thank you. Happy to be here and looking forward to talking to you about this. So from reading a little bit about you, uh, you were a highly successful figure skater early in your career. So one of my questions is, what was the main motivation for you to go into medicine? Actually, it was my strong interest in nutrition that drove me to go to medical school. I wanted to you know, do things a different way, and I thought the medical profession was quite barbaric and going in the wrong direction, relying on using medications and surgeries for what are primarily dietary-induced illnesses. Sticking with this topic, U.S. medical schools, as you know, generally do not spend much, if any, time teaching students about nutrition, and most physicians are not interested or trained in the topic. If a patient addresses this topic, doctors typically refer um, the patient to a dietitian if that's available at the institution or at the, at the office. You, are, you answered this partly before. I mean, how do you, so you were interested in this aspect of medicine from the very beginning, was one of the reasons you actually went into medicine. That's correct. That was the main reason I did go, into, go to medical school. I, you know, I, as you mentioned, I was a competitive athlete and I used nutrition, you know, for bettering stamina and perform, you know, and didn't want to get sick. But I, my father was overweight and sickly, and he brought these nutritional books into the home because he had kidney problems and back issues and other arthritis conditions. And it improved his health so much that I became interested in reading what he was learning and doing. And as I was, did more research and reading through my teenage and years and my young adult years, I became more fascinated and interesting with that um, how the medical profession was not only missing the boat, but actually causing so much needless death and suffering. Mm -hmm. And that's only been reinforced today when you see people with their asthmatics for their whole life and they're not told that they could improve their diet and wean off and get off the medication and get well. They have people suffering with psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, getting kidney failure, and even dying of lupus, and, being, and where that nutrition could have given them a whole and, and a whole life free of illness if they had, if it was been the primary, um, if it was the primary um, type of treatment modality utilized, they wouldn't have had to have been sick their whole life. Instead, they go to a rheumatologist and they get put on cancer causing drugs for the rest of their life and, and so often deteriorate and have a very um, tragic life. And then you have the, the major causes of death in America, heart attacks, strokes, dementia, and cancers that are m largely nutritional issues. We've literally won the war on cancer already. We can wipe out more than 90% of more of cancer, common cancers in America right now. And I've always say we've landed the man on the moon already. By that, I mean that we've already discovered what causes cancer and how to not have cancer. But people don't like the answer. The answer is vegetables. Yeah. You know, they're looking for a different answer. They want a magic pill they can take and pay 10000 a month for so they can still eat pizza and burgers and hot dogs and bacon and not get breast cancer and prostate cancer. It's never going to happen. You're not going to invent a magic pill that's going to enable people to smoke three packs a day and not get lung cancer. Um, yeah, so we, we have the answer. We don't have to have heart attacks and strokes and dementia today. Nutritional science has made such incredible advances in the last de two decades that we give people the opportunity to live a healthy 
and happy life right through their later years to, to, to you know, between 95 and 105 years old would be available for most people with these advances in nutritional science. So I make this science available for those who want it and you don't have to have it. You want to eat like other Americans, you can have it happen to you what happens to other Americans and, and take, make life a crapshoot and suffer with medical problems and dementia and all kinds of medical dependencies and pain in your later years. But that doesn't have to happen to us today because nutrition is so powerful. Couldn't agree with this more. Um, sticking with this topic, um, in the introduction to your latest book, you state that Americans spend more than $100 million a day, which is really uh, you know, mind-boggling on diets and weight loss programs, which amounts to about $40 billion a year. Yet at the same time, Americans are the most obese uh, people in the world. And in my opinion, this paradox is mirrored by the discrepancy between national health care expenditures in general and general health of the American public, which ranks uh, you know, way down, way below uh, other um, developed countries. What, what are the main reasons for these surprising statistics? Well, you know, we're talking about how America, how we developed our eating style and how um, drugs became the answer to the medical profession directed their um, focus on medications, which are poisonous, poisons to solve the problems of toxemia in a, in a diet, in a bad diet. I mean, this has been going on since, you know, no civil war, since the early, you know, this is a, a long history. I wrote about this history in my most recent book called Fast Food Genocide. So Eat to Live is not my most recent book. My most recent book is Fast Food Genocide, which tracks the history of the food, um, you know, the history of food in America, how pellagra, around after the Civil War, niacin deficiencies from the diet of being high in corn and pork and molasses created suicidal and homicidal and violent behavior and exacerbated with the Jim Crow laws, exacerbated lynchings and violence against blacks because it, meant, it made you mentally volatile. Um, and so nutrition played a role back then in having people um, in, in, in causing mental illness in people. Pellagra caused a red necklace or a causal necklace, which was a dermatitis from the neck, or the original of the term rednecks, was violent whites attacking blacks back in the, in the Civil War. And then we, we drove black, black Americans were doing well um, economically and health-wise soon after the Civil War, after they were, the, um, they were freed after the Civil War. And, and now it's almost like, and then when, when they were driven into northern cities and didn't have access to vegetables, so the population doesn't have access to vegetables. And then we have, of course, pellagra was denied as being a nutritional problem for the early part of the, of the 20th century, too. I mean, it was denied until even in the early 1900s, they were denying pellagra where they thought it was genetic. And then we had hookworm was very big in the South. But in, in any case, um, finally, it was recognized as a nutritional problem how it can affect the brain, but, but 100 years ago, we had one in 100 Americans who were mentally ill. Now it's one in five Americans who are mentally ill. With the advent of the, of the, of the World War I and World War II and the meeting, making food that can have, be sustained on the battlefield, that didn't have to be refrigerated, that could be accessed into the plastic bag, you know, Spam and Twinkies and Tang and all these things, and then, and then, the food, then becoming the cheapest way to feed large populations in inner cities. We had, then we feeding our populations on processed foods, which caused um, medical conditions, mental difficulties, education, lowering educational achievement, lowering opportunity, lowering, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a major form of how you should say um, institutionalized racism that now that black Americans have high rates of kidney disease, high blood pressure, prostate cancer, and, and more diabetes and early life death, it's blamed on them in medical schools and medical institutions as somewhat being genetically weaker which is absolutely untrue, we see the same difficulties with Caucasian populations eating a bad diet as well. And so I'm, I'm saying right now that, that there's, a lot of, there's a lot of, you're asking me a question that's very complicated and very intertwined with the history of our country, but we became the, how should we say, the, the innovators in the fast food movement in making processed and fast food. And then, and then we became the innovators in designing foods to be addictive and to get people to not to, to want to eat them, even though they destroyed our health. And, just, and, we, and now eating addictive substances and living on addic addictive foods have become the major pastime in America with the vast majority of Americans are food addicts and are eating themselves to a premature death. But we've rapidly spread this concept all over the world. So now we're seeing 
Kentucky Fried Chicken, McDonald's, potato chips, you know, cheese doodles and Fritos and coat and sodas going now all over the world, which never had happened in, in 20 years ago in certain populations that had 150th the amount of breast cancer as we had in this country, 150th the amount, are now have 150th the amount or half the amount because we're seeing cancer rates skyrocketing in countries that are adopting our fast food nation's habits that, we, that we've developed over the last 40, 30, or 40 years. Yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty, um, I mean, it's, it has tragic uh, consequences. And obviously, you know, we have built a very sophisticated, extremely expensive healthcare industry around it. So the unfortunate thing is that these, these negative effects of diet are feeding a whole industry, a multi-billion dollar industry that has now its own lobbying powers and is, you know, promoting a very different message, not one about healthy diets, but one about you know, novel pills and magic pills that can deal exactly. with you. So, That's exactly uh, true. That triad of the food, the processed food industry, the medical and pharmacology industry, and the healthcare industry is, is the major monetary, of most, well, most economic power affecting lobbyists, governmental action, governmental change. In other words, our, our, popula our country is largely run by these interest groups that want to, that the status quo of using drugs to treat people that are poisoning themselves with a disease causing diet. It's very hard to change that way of seeing things. And the medically upkill care crisis and the cost of medical care can never be solved in Washington through legislature. It can only be solved by people getting healthier and us changing the way we eat and live because these diseases are just getting worse and they're expensive and, and the medical care is, in, is ineffective. Yeah, yeah. It's not, a, you know, it's, it's not, we don't need more medical care. We need, we need to have less people being sick and you Excellent. can't get that by getting people better access to medical care or doctors. Yeah. yeah. Um, switching the topic a little bit, a, a key concept in your teachings and books is something you call the health equation, which mm -hmm. you formulated as health is predicted by your nutrient intake divided by calories. It's a very simple formula, even compared to Einstein's famous formula, uh, formula E equals M times C squared. Right. Um, and you provide a lot of details about the equation in your book, but can you explain the main idea behind it and the reasons why this is so central to your program? Sure, I'll try. Um, first of all, there's some basic principles we have to consider here. And the most proven methodology to extend human lifespan and slow aging, which is reproducible in all species of animals, is moderate caloric restriction in the context of micronutrient excellence. So what I'm saying right now is we have to have sufficient micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, and antioxidants, while not overeating on calories. And that's what slows aging, because what stabilizes our stem cells, our telomeres, are obviously the cell's ability to keep itself youthful and to prevent the buildup of advanced glycation end products and reactive oxygen species that age our tissues. And only with a large exposure to these um, colorful plants do we get enough of these phytochemicals to stabilize the DNA. Um, furthermore, fat on the body produces lipokines and cytokines that are pro-inflammatory. They produce, fat on the body produces um, angiogenesis promoters, which, which pr is permissively allows blood vessels to go to feed cancer. And fat on the body, of course, activates the, it's a low oxygen, it's a low blood perfused, but it's not highly vascular perfused. So the low oxygen delivery makes it secrete more pro-inflammatory compounds, which then excites aromatase production, producing more estrogen, increasing risk of breast cancer and prostate cancer. So I'm saying now there's no such thing as an overweight, healthy person. The extra fat on the body promotes cancer and accelerates aging. So we have to have a favorable weight. So we're trying to get more nutrients without becoming, without our weight becoming unfavorable, which means we have to eat foods which give us a good micronutrient bang per caloric buck. But I'm also saying that the high level of micronutrients and fiber in the diet naturally suppresses appetite. As you're very much aware, when you eat a lot of fiber, it, the bacteria it fuels the growth of healthy bacteria in the gut that then produce short chain fatty acids, predominantly butyrate, and butyrate has a negative feedback loop in the hypothalamus to decrease appetite, 
So without, so fiber becomes a regulator of apostat. And when you eat foods that are high in calories, but no significant nutrient load, like white flour, sugar, marshmallows, honey, maple syrup, cookies, or salad oils, and fried foods, as you eat calorically concentrated foods with no significant nutrient load, of course, that has the opposite effect. That signals dopamine release in the brain, makes you become addicted to food, makes you become dopamine insensitive, and makes you become a calorie consuming monster. So then you become unable to control your caloric intake when you're consuming all these low fiber, low nutrient foods. So that you can sustain a dietary model with the right amount of calories only when you focus on the nutritional quality of what you're eating. When you try to willy nilly cut back on calories without improving the quality of your, what you're eating, you, beget, you become you get unrelenting drives to continue to overeat and dieting or eating the right amount of calories becomes uncomfortable. It's only when you eat healthy do you desire the amount of calories you require. When you eat unhealthy, you desire more calories than you require. So Thanks. it's complicated. I'm trying to go over, go over, the over an overview here, but to give people the idea that the secret to, to sustained weight loss is eating to prevent cancer. You follow me? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it makes a lot of sense to me. So whatever you said, you know, um, I, I couldn't agree with this more. And I, I really like the science that you provide to back it up because many people that write these kind of books do not have the scientific background or, you know, copy the scientific background from, from areas that they're not really uh, totally familiar with. So I, I, I really like the way you, you just presented that. Um, but let me ask you, if, if, if your diet plan is more successful than the great majority of other strategies to fight obesity and reduce many diseases related to obesity, why is it not taught in medical school and adopted by national agencies like, like the FDA? It, it, it seems as a country, we're more interested in spending hundreds of millions of dollars in, in research um, and drug development and promote, promote invasive surgical procedures like bariatric surgeries than implementing relatively simple recommendations as your nutrient-rich diet plan. I mean, this is always sort of the puzzle to me. Why can this not be become national policy? Agreed. You know, we have, we spend billions, scores of billions of dollars on drug studies and we can't get, you know, it's very difficult to get any kind of studies done to evaluate this. And, and that's why, you know, that's why we have the Nutritional Research Foundation so we can um, try to procure funding to do studies to show the efficacy of nutritional excellence, not just preventatively, but also to reverse disease. And right now I have a long, I have a study running at Northern Arizona University um, called the Nutritarian Women's Health Study, where we have 2,500 women signed up to be eating a diet rich in G-bombs, these anti-cancer foods, and to follow a nutritarian diet, followed for decades, following them for decades. So, you know, medical studies are prohibitively expensive. It's hard to fund them on our own. We're not going to get the support of the of industry funding, and nor will government fund studies that support nutrition. You know, it's, the funding is very limited. I was working with, um, in, in University of Pennsylvania, um, with the ophthalmologists on staff there, and they submitted, a, and they saw so many of my patients who had reversed their diabetic retinopathy and macular degeneration due to a nutritarian diet, and they themselves, some of the ophthalmologists there, um, helped their own health, high blood pressure and cholesterol, and they submitted, a, and 10 of them got together and submitted a $1.5 million grant to the NIH to study the nutritarian diet, or a high nutrient, um, you know, plant-rich diet to reverse eye diseases. And the NIH turned them down because it said that they are not, because it would only give nutritional money towards those researchers that have, they have gotten grants from them in the past. They have their own boys club. They wouldn't, even though this team of doctors from the University of Pennsylvania um, School of Medicine had done NIH grants before because their grants were in eye disease and not nutrition, but this was nutrition and eye disease together, they wouldn't, they turned down their grants. So it's very, very, it's almost impossible for us to get grants um, based on what we want to do. So it's sounds, very difficult to raise the money to do the studies. Sounds very familiar. I, I could, could tell you the same stories, you know, the, the, the experiences we have had with national funding. Right. Um, one, one question I had, I mean, reading the introduction to your Eat to Live book, you use language that's almost reminiscent of a hypnosis induction. 
you, mm -hmm. you assure the patient with near, nearly 100% certainty that they will achieve dramatic and sustained weight loss if they, if they only follow your advice and your, your program. Um, what percentage of people that have read your book, and they're in the millions, obviously, mm -hmm. have achieved and maintained these goals? Well, that's an impossible question for me to answer because I, you know, millions of people have read my books and I don't know what percent of people doing them, but I do know when we, when we run immersion weeks for Whole Foods Market and they send their most overweight and sickly um, team members into our week programs, or when I see people in the office and I'm able to um, give them information, we track their outcomes, we find that approximately 20% of the people that are exposed to this information make the necessary improvements to get long-term late weight loss benefits. That means about 80% get the information and aren't able to do it because of the pull of their family, their social environment, how powerful food addictions are. So what, you're, what we're both insinuating here is that, and agreeing on, is that even when people are exposed to this information, the majority of people learning the best possible information that can save their lives, don't do it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's incredibly frustrating that, um, that, that people would rather die than quit smoking or they die than give up burgers and bacon and cheeseburgers and pizza and soda. They'd rather drop, you know, and they, they do. They, they, they call me from the emergency room and they call me from the ICU saying, I know I should have listened to you when you saw me in the office last month, but I didn't do it. And mm -hmm. now I'm going to do it, but I've already had the heart attack, you know? So it's like, well, you had to wait till you have the heart attack. I told you you were going to have a heart attack if you didn't make the change, you know? So you, you don't underestimate the addictive potential of the food and how the foods, I call them Franken foods, they've been designed to hook people. And, and, and with the negative peer pressure in so many people, and it's, it's socially integrated in our society that you eat the way other Americans eat. So everybody eats a diet that's creating massive suicide, you know, massive destruction with food. And we just have to fit in and be a social animal and do what other people do and come in and, and people would rather die than and be different. But it gives me a chance to plug my own work here. And I, and with that, I, and because I'm, I should say I'm, I'm so enthusiastic and passionate about getting people well that I opened up a retreat in San Diego where people can come and stay with me for eight to 12 weeks, just like a cocaine or drug rehabilitation retreat where people go for three months, where overweight, diabetic, heart disease, psoriasis, where people with medical conditions and overweight and food addictions can stay with us. And we have um, psychotherapists specializing in food addiction. We have the Gress best chefs, we have incredible chefs, you know, and on all, every, you know, all the proper personnel there to make sure these people enjoy their stay, learn how to cook, learn how to make the food taste fantastic, have the time away from their addictive triggers to get to ruin, to reduce and eliminate that love affair with poisonous foods. And they leave there after three months, let's say, or two months, not needing to eat those foods anymore and really enjoying and staying on this type of program. So I'm saying that the longer the person stays immersed into the program, the less like they're attracted to eat the junk food other Americans are eating. And the more their tastes have been retrained to enjoy a natural food, like a natural dessert made of a frozen banana with some real vanilla bean powder and some macadamia nuts blended up to form a vanilla ice cream, tastes better than the conventional ice cream with all that chemicals and sweets because your taste buds, you can taste the chemicals and those things become too sweet to you. And you prefer the, the, the vegetables with the Thai peanut wax, you know, um, curry sauce rather than eating an oil, you know, a, a fried food. In other words, what I'm saying right now is just like any other addiction, that the longer the time of abstinence, the more the addictive behavior becomes less of a, of a pull or an attraction for people. And we take the, we, we wipe out the recidivism rate. So instead of having 20% um, of people who learn about this program being able to do it, we now have 80% of the people who learn about this program being able to do it. When you put them in, or more even, even 90%, we put them in a facility where we give them the, prop, the full kind of training that we're talking about here. So, I, so even for those people that are really, who need it the most, that are so overweight and sickly and feel addicted, I still have a program that I think can help, that I can help those people tremendously. Yeah, this is really interesting. I mean, this, this whole topic of food addiction uh, that, that you just talked about. Um, and as you know, if, if you give a certain questionnaire, <clears throat> the Yale food addiction questionnaire to people, about 20% of obese individuals um, uh, qualify, and then with this increases this percentage with increasing uh, with the increasing amount of obesity. So people that go for 
bariatric surgery, probably 80% of them meet that uh, definition. And you partly answer the question, I mean, knowing how difficult it is to achieve lasting cure from any type of addiction, it's surprising that you know, um, a significant number of people just following your diet program um, are able to overcome it. Maybe they're the ones that uh, don't have the full-blown addiction and those individuals then get better if you go, go into a long-term program like you just described. Would you, would you agree with that? No, not at all. I don't agree with that. That some of the most sickly, I'm, I'm sorry, let me just make sure my phone is turned and shut off. Yeah, um, so, you know, I would say that the most sickly and overweight people weigh 300, 400 pounds. Most severe food addicts who've tried dieting in the past, but in many programs who have failed, um, succeed on this program because, and I'm also disagreeing that the most obese and those people following those questionnaires um, have a certain percent being food addicts. I consider like, um, you know, more than 80% of the American population as being food addicts because they're all, because we have a complete overweight population. All overweight people have some degree of food addiction. They know it's not good to be overweight or obese. They know it's not good for their health to have high cholesterol, high blood pressure, yet they continue eating and living in a manner that's, that's accelerating their death and we know that that and we know that when you are unhealthy, you're not in contact with the instinctual hunger, telling you how much food to eat. You're because you're every time you stop eating, you get withdrawal from your excess calories and from your buildup of toxic metabolic waste products and free radicals. You start to feel shaky and weak and fatigued and anxiety and withdrawal depression from unhealthy food. So almost all Americans are not in touch with the instinctual design, um, amount of calories they need. They're all they're, In other words, what percent of Americans are overweight today? Because conventional authorities tell us 70% are overweight or obese, but that's because they use BMI of 25 as the demarcation line between normal and overweight. When all long-lived societies have, are all with BMIs below 23 for a male and below 22 for a female. When we lose 23 as the demarcation line, then we get 89% of Americans are overweight. Mm -hmm. And if we look at that 11% of people who are in the normal weight category, the vast majority of them are in normal weight because they're sickly, because they have because they smoke cigarettes or they have alcoholism or food or, or, um, or they have some medical problem keeping them underweight. It's only about 2.5% of Americans that are a normal weight because they eat healthy and they exercise regularly. So um, I'm just saying I'm not underestimating how pervasive and um, impactful food addiction has been on destroying the health of Americans and it permeates all aspects of our society and contributes to violence, mental illness, illness and criminal behavior. You know, and the, and the link in scientific studies between the consumption of candy and processed foods in childhood and later life violence and criminality is very strong. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. One, one of the challenges for the consumer is the fact that there's an ever increasing number of books out there and social media blogs and posts that make similar claims about their effect, their own effectiveness for permanent weight loss and health. What is most confusing to the lay consumer is the fact that these recommendations are often diametrically different from each other. So keto diet, high fat diet, paleo diet, intermittent fasting, fasting mimicking diets. If you pick up any of these best selling books in these categories, you know, they promote very different things. Do all these approaches work or do you believe, I mean, I'm sure that you believe that and, and, and you probably know it, that your nutrient-rich diet program is better than these other approaches? Yes, because, you know, what I'm teaching here and what I want people to remember is that any type of um, radical or hypothesis can be shown to be effective in the short run. If I feed you just Twinkies or cookies, you get sick of eating Twinkies, you reduce your calories because you're only eating one food and you'll, and you'll try glycerides look better, you'll lose weight and things might improve in the short run. For something to, you know, we want to look at, we want to have a different criteria to evaluating when the, whether one thing, whether something makes sense to you or not. Number one is the foods that form the portfolio of foods eaten. Are they shown to extend lifespan, those individual foods? Are they linked to lower rates of cancer or are they linked to higher rates of cancer? Or, or not extend, or they, are they foods that have been shown to extend human lifespan, number one. Number two, when we're looking at, uh, at dietary portfolios, has this been evaluated 
in studies that look at hard endpoints over decades. In other words, what I'm saying, there's three, ki three criteria we have to use to judge the safety of a program. Number one, is it been studied with large numbers of people, tens of thousands of people? Have, have the studies gone on for decades, 10 or 20 years? Over those periods of years, are we looking at hard endpoints like heart attacks and strokes and cancer? Or is it just, it's just a short-term study for a year or two where somebody might have lowered their blood pressure, lost some weight, or lowered their triglycerides? When you look at the, all these criteria together, the anti-cancer effects of foods, the effects of pe what people eat in the blue zones, who the longest, you know, the, the most centenarians live, at the epidemiologic studies that we have available that shows what kind of food patterns increase lifespan, we always find the same thing. And that is more vegetables and beans and nuts in the diet makes for longer life and lower rates of cancer. And more processed foods shortens lifespan, more high glycemic carbohydrates shorten lifespan, and more animal products shorten lifespan. So if we divide food into three different categories, number one, produce, number two, animal products, and number three, processed foods, then we only have one category out of those three, and that's produce that's been shown to prevent cancer, slow aging, and extend human lifespan. We can talk about the nuances now, but one thing we know is that diets that are low in carbohydrates that don't include fruit have been shown to shorten lifespan and increase premature mortality. The ketogenic diets that are trying to induce ketosis by the restriction of carbohydrates in plants have at this point in human history been shown to be damaging to long-term survival and enhance. So whether you're looking at higher animal product diets, more paleo diets, more keto diets, or the low-fat vegan diets have also been shown to shorten lifespan too. The minute you take nuts and seeds out of a diet and you make the diet so low in fat, you're so fearful of eating fat, you're just living on potatoes and rice and, and beans and no, and no nuts, that low level of fat has also been shown to increase mortality from both cardiovascular mortality and cancer mortality. So I'd have to say that overwhelmingly, a nutritarian diet has the most scientific support for slowing aging, enhancing longevity. And then when you apply it clinically to people with diseases, it's very effectively reverses disease and becomes the most effective therapeutically. Also following those popular vegan diets that don't recommend, some of them don't recommend DHA or EPA supplementation, which are commonly called fish oil, but you can get vegan EPA and DHA. And we're starting to see later life vegans becoming more propensity and more numbers of them just demonstrating dementia and shrinkage of the brain with aging because they weren't properly supplementing their diet to assure DHA adequacy, which is needed for proper brain function, especially with aging. So there's just too many boxes that are not appropriately checked to assure safety and longevity in diet. So I'm much more careful to make sure every box is checked to assure that nothing interferes with you achieving a long and happy and, 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 and life free of, free of these problems that could develop. Yeah, when I listen to you, I mean, personally, I couldn't agree with, uh, with you more, just following the scientific literature and, and mm -hmm. you know, seeing patients myself. Um, the, the, the problem is, you know, there is still a very popular, a significant uh, segment of the population that are aggressively promoting you know, the keto diet and, you know, there's always this typical argument. Um, I lost all my brain fog. I, I, I feel better. Um, you know, I've, I've never felt so well. So um, it's probably something that happens in the short term, as you said, but in terms of talking about longevity and risk for, for disease, there doesn't seem to be any question what you just summarized is, is, right. is an and of course, if you cut out the carb, if you cut out processed foods and carbohydrates and sweets, you're going to lose the brain fog. So it's true that when people go on the keto or the paleo diet and they stop eating donuts and cookies and sauces, you know, nothing, and they stop eating junk food, they're going to feel better from that alone. But that doesn't make the high animal product co consumption any less dangerous. It's just another. It, it might even be, you know. So we're saying here that. It's all about replacement foods. In other words, we true, we want to take out the junk food that's destructive to the brain. And we know high glycemic carbohydrates like white rice and even white potato in high amounts in a diet and sugary foods are destructive to the brain. But that doesn't mean we replace those foods with meat, 
-hmm. and more high end animal products to get better. We have to replace those foods with more vegetables and beans and nuts and less animal products to maximize lifespan. Okay, so slightly shift in topics. The, the, the probably has never been a time in history when Americans were so obsessed with and worried about what they eat to lose weight or to stay healthy as today. And terms have been coined like the national eating disorder or orthorexia uh, to characterize the situation. If I can, when I travel, like in Europe, for example, um, Eating good and healthy has been an essential part of the national culture in, for hundreds of years in many of these countries. And this, this obsession with, with diets has really been imported with all the American you know, unhealthy foods, it seems, in the last decade or so. Um, in many of these countries, obesity is much less of a problem than in the US. Um, I mean, do you, do you agree with this, that we are in the US where we don't have a a culture that's ingrained in us and that we have lived with for, for hundreds of sometimes thousands of years, that that's a main reason why we're so lost in that respect? No, um, I don't know what, 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 let me just make a few comments. Number one, we have the most overweight and sickly population ever in the history of the human race in this country. So because we have so many overweight and sickly people, of course, we're gonna be obsessed with food and overeating but the solutions we've come to to try to solve the problems don't work because people aren't there because you can't just willy nilly give you these crazy diets and cut back on calories and expect you to be feel satisfied when you're nutritionally deficient. So the, so it's, you know, I think I have the answer to that problem and we're still ex exporting the American way of life and other populations that were living on more, more on natural foods that they can grow or farm locally didn't have these medical problems. But when they start to have access to the so-called rich diet, that we eat and they get start to become more economically, um, when they improve their economic circumstance and can eat more meat and more oil and more fried food and more fast food, it's designed, a lot of these foods are designed to, to entice people to eat them. And then they start to get sick and overweight just like us. So it's not, I don't think indigenous, it's not you know, a structure of the American mindset. It's we've had access to these dangerous foods for longer periods of time. And because of that, we're suffering longer. And as other populations get access to those foods, they also start to see obesity and you know, these diseases develop and start to spring up. And so we look at a, a, Polyne a Polynesian island, you know, um, who, who those, they're free for centuries. Their populations were free of diabetes and were slim and healthy. And Americans came in there. We brought in fast food and processed foods. And the whole population became diabetic, like on the Marshall Islands, right? We took over the Marshall Islands. We brought in fast food and the, the populations who used to be healthy are now all diabetic. The, the Pima Indian tribes in New Mexico, Me Mexico border for thousands of centuries always were healthy and thin and active and lived long lives. And now we came in there, they became wealthy and started eating American food because of their genetic structure on the diets they were used to. They now all became diabetic and obese and they've been very, very sickly. It's, it's always um, starts with the American processed food industry moving in, infecting an area, and then we see these diseases and food addictions start to flourish. Um, so it's, if you take an animal and you put an, you know, a rabbit or a squirrel or a mouse or a monkey into, a, into a, a scientific experiment and you let them have their food they're naturally eating in their natural environment, they won't become overweight even in captivity. Eat the amount of food that they want to eat and they'll stop eating before they get overweight. But then we give them cheese doodles and donuts and french fries and they'll stop eating their natural diet and they'll start eating these highly palatable highly calorically concentrated foods because the animal will go for more caloric concentration stimulating brain function and they'll no longer eat their own existing diet until they eat themselves until they start to become overweight and sickly it's like you put a, a, a bird in a cage and the bird could take sugar water or cocaine the bird will take cocaine and stop eating food It'll keep, the last thing it does before it dies, it'll take one more hit on the cocaine. What I'm saying is dopamine is a more powerful driver of behavior than our, than our innate intelligence is. And our population is driven by these primitive desires to, get, to go after concentrated calories and concentrated flavors over and above their intellect and the primitive brain then takes over decision making. You lose the keys to the bank when you're an addict. You're not making decisions based on weighing what's best for your long term, your life in the long term. You're going for immediate satisfaction and immediate gratification. And, and you're saying, I don't, you know, you're saying, you know, I don't care about the future me. 
I don't care about what happens to me 10 years down the road. Let me enjoy my life now. Let me get, and, and who cares how sick I get later? And that's how addicts think. And, and so it, it's a difficult question, but it's understandable given the nature of food exposure in our country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, there, there are many, we, we talked about this a little bit before, but we want to come back to this. There, there are many diets and, and drug treatments that can achieve short-term weight loss. Mm -hmm. The main problem really seems to be sustaining an optimal weight af after the weight loss. And there's this well-known phenomenon of the yo-yo effect, meaning that people regain and actually overshoot their pre-treatment weight. It's, it's interesting that recently there's been some very interesting science the role of the microbiome in that yo-yo effect that somehow there's some kind of a memory at the at the at the gut level of this uh, of this phenomenon and even famous weight loss weight loss programs like the biggest loser have had this problem why why do you think your program is able to avoid it um right well i, I did write a book on that subject by the way in the book that i i call the end of dieting and i in the book the end of Diet. Which was, one, which was one of my recent books written three years ago. It discussed the dangers of going on and off diets and yo-yoing your weight and why food and why people don't succeed on diets and why the focus here is different because the focus is not the, on the immediate short-term weight loss. It's focused on long-term health and how we have to eat for our long-term health to prevent dementia, to prevent cancer, to prevent heart disease. And we're doing something, we're recognizing that the changes we make in the short term have to be maintained for the rest of your life. Anything you do short term will have no long term benefits unless you stayed with it. So if you were drinking some pink drink to lose weight or some dangerous keto or paleo diet to lose weight, it's no benefit to you unless you stay eating that way for the rest of your life because the weight's not gonna stay off you and the minute you come off that diet, it's gonna come back worse than it was before. So anything you do in the short term, anything you can't maintain for the rest of your life is no value in doing. So the biggest loser was the most, is a ridiculously ignorant concept. People couldn't maintain that degree of exercise when they, in, the, in, their, in the real world. They're not gonna be living their life doing hard, long, um, hardcore exercise for two hours a day. That's not real, realistic. You know, so, and they're, and they're still, in, they still have the problem of nutritional deficiencies that drive them to over eat calories. So it's just, so bad programs get bad results, right? So this is, what I'm saying is this is different. We wanna teach people why they should live healthfully and why they should learn to cook in a healthy manner and how to make healthy foods taste great and the change they make they're trying to incorporate for the rest of their life not temporarily and just because it causes tre tremendous weight for you to normalize your weight it's not going to maintain that unless you stayed on the same program for the rest of your life you're not it's not doing you're not eating this way temporarily and we're eating this way to not get dementia live a happy life and we're making the food taste delicious anyway so we re retrain the taste buds so you prefer this way of eating. I enjoy eating a nutritarian diet the best. I like the flavor of it the best. We have nutritarian restaurants that make like gourmet nutritarian food. And I have cookbooks on the Eat to Live cookbook, for example, on how to make healthy food taste great. So we want people to incorporate this new way of eating into their life permanently with the right degree of intellectual um, you know, awareness that if you're not going to make these changes and stay with it forever, it's not going to benefit you to do it parts, to do it for a short period of time and go back to eating the old way again, because then your weight's going to come back and then it's, it's not, it's, it made you worse off to, okay. to make your weight up and down. You know, yeah. so, you know, so we're in agreement that you have, that healthy eating has to be the focus here, not just weight loss. Okay, absolutely. One question that often comes up, when you adhere to a nutrient-rich calorie restricted diet um, rich in in produce and is is there any need to take supplements which has become obviously a huge business or do you get enough from from this kind of a diet no i think that supplements become absolutely essential when your level of animal product consumption gets too low because you're you can be become b12 deficient because uh, you need animal products for b12 you also only absorb 20 percent of the zinc in plant foods. And the, the, and the other major factor, weakness in a diet that's largely plants, is, getting, is having to get sufficient DHA and EPA for the brain. About half the people will not make enough EPA and DHA from plants. They, they, they are more animal product dependent for that EPA or DHA. So we wanna make sure that people supplement conservatively and intelligently and don't develop long-term problems with depression or dementia because they're not taking B12 
and DHA, for example, are the two most critical supplements to take when, you're on a, when your diet is largely plants. You're not eating seafood and wild animals that would supply that DHA or B12. Hmm. Um, another question related to the, this increase, increase or you know, optimization of intake of plant-based foods so considering the chemicals that are being used today to grow um, much of our plant-based food, in particular chemical fertilizers and insecticides, isn't there a risk that you inadvertently ingest a lot of things as part of a plant-based diet that are potentially harmful? That's, there's always the risk of taking in potentially dangerous toxins from food and being contaminated with biological agents, with E. coli, with, gly with glyphosate, with, with chemicals on your food. Yes, there's always the risk. However, the, by, because of the laws of biological concentration, there's more residual toxicity and chemical residue in animal products than there are in plant foods. So as a whole, analyzing the level of chemical residue in animal products versus plants, there's much more in animal products than plants. There's no one, so what I, am, what we're, I think we're agreeing on is that the quality of our food matters, we don't want food to be contaminated or have chemical pesticides or, res or residue or infected bacteria or parasites or, or we don't want our food contaminated. And that, that's why you're growing you some of your own food is valuable. That's why buying organic and not especially in things we know that are heavily treated, certain like the, big, the, the, um, the dirty dozen. I mean, recent studies just came out showing that a large amount of the kale consumed and made in this country has a lot of pesticide residue on it. It's very important to eat the leafy greens now organically to make sure you're, you're not getting too much pesticide or chemical residue. It is an issue, and we and an issue that we we you know an issue that we have to be con some concern about to eating to trying to eat more organic, supporting organic growers, and to removing chemicals from our environment. Last last question: um, Do you consider yourself a functional medicine doctor, a diet guru, or simply a highly successful educator about anything related to? a healthy diet and longevity? I don't like any of those terms because, you know, I think that I'm a progressive physician and the way I practice should be the way other physicians practice as well. It shouldn't be, it's, it's not alternative or complementary or um, functional. This is just the right way of, pra of people should be cared for. And I consider myself a specialist in nutritional medicine so that when you're, when you're a diabetic and you come to me, I know exactly how to get you off the insulin. So you, if you're a type one, I give, you know, you're only gonna to have to need half as much insulin, get rid of your highs and lows. If you have kidney problems, I know the diet that's gonna be best for your kidney, so you're not gonna have, your, you know, your potassium won't go that high. And if you come to me with heart disease, I know the diet to help reverse that. If you come to me with lupus, I know how to cut back on your medications appropriately, when to start cutting back, which ones to cut back first, the lupus patient who shouldn't eat alfalfa sprouts, what foods is the psoriasis patient most sensitive ties to usually, most often my experience, my expertise is in helping people get well through nutritional methods. And I consider, and it's a high, and it is a, a medical specialty that most doctors aren't trained or skilled in. So I'm, so I consider, so that's what I really prefer to be seen as, and not as giving one of those other common terms, which makes it seem like it's something that, you know, that's, hocus pocus, you know what I mean? Or, yes. or something that's alternative or, this is, the, this is really what the science supports the best is the way I practice. And it's the way all doctors should be practicing and the way they're practicing should be seen as alternative or some way um, radical. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, this was really um, enlightening to me and particularly, uh, I, I think what you just said is really confirms the information that you provide and uh, you know it's because I've, I've talked to other people on these in these interviews that mm -hmm. fall in some of these categories and it's it's usually very different you know it's not I could easily see you know working with a person would actually love to work with a person like yourself in our in our department because you know we don't have it we have dietitians who know maybe one maybe 10 percent of what you have been saying and writing about you know which is Right. It's not worth for me to send somebody to a dietitian that is not really up to, 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 the, to the science and the experience that, that, that you have been um, talking about now the last hour. Well, thank you very well, much. It's been really, um, really good talking to you, and I hope we, we may have a continuation of this conversation in the, in the future. Thank you. Looking forward to talking again, and good luck to, of course, you and all your listeners. 
Okay, thanks very much.